Hello, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, I guess, depending on when you watch this. Uh, anyway, if you're uh, joining us today at Avenue for the first time, you're very welcome. Um, or if you've just forgotten as well, you're joining us in the middle of a series that we're in, looking at the book of the Bible called 1 Peter. It's the first letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to a group of churches scattered across Asia Minor. In particular, though, we're in the middle of this kind of inception-like series within a series, because we're spending a few weeks looking at the different aspects of this picture of the church that Peter is painting for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So uh, in the first week we spent in this verse, we looked at Peter's description of the church as a people who've been chosen. Chosen, he tells us elsewhere in the letter, by God before the foundation of the world. And that reminded us that if you're a Christian, you are part of a people who God chose for himself before you even existed. And then last week we saw that Peter also describes Christians as a royal priesthood. Now that's a description that only a limited number of people could have been described as before Jesus. And Richard showed us last week that this status of priest means that we now have access to God, which is even better than the access the priests of the Old Testament had. And that we can therefore bring others to God through praying, and if you like, introducing them to him. And we did see that that involves making spiritual sacrifices, giving things up we might want, like and enjoy for the sake and the benefit and the blessing of others. And so then today, to add to both of these descriptions that we've seen in the verse so far, we're looking at the next layer that Peter adds on to this picture of the church. So as well as being a chosen people and a royal priesthood, Peter goes on to describe this church as a holy nation. We are a holy nation. As a group of Christians spread out around the world, we are a new spiritual nation, unlike any other nation on earth. This nation isn't based on ethnicity or geography or allegiance to a king or a ruler or a flag even. No, instead this nation is united by its allegiance to its king, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you're a Christian, you are a member of this new holy nation and this nation is holy. That means that we're set apart. We saw this a few weeks ago when we looked at chapter one. That means we're created to be different from every other nation we're set apart for a specific and a unique purpose now we're going to look at that purpose in a little more detail in a few weeks time at the end of this verse because peter describes that purpose as being that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light as a holy nation we are holy we're set apart to declare praise to and about god and we will do that. The Bible makes it clear that one day as a worldwide church, as his bride gathered to him, we will declare and demonstrate his praiseworthiness to the entire universe. That is guaranteed in the future. But we're also to do that now, how we can. And specifically, we're to do that as a local kind of outcrop of this worldwide holy nation, as a local church here in Leicester, 2,000 years after the letter of 1 Peter was written. And I think this picture of us as a local church being a part of a holy nation, being a representative, being an embassy of this holy nation, I think that gives us three encouragements that we're going to see today. Three things I want us to think about on the back of us being a holy nation. The first thing that this description encourages us to do is to become a part of this holy nation. Become a part of of this holy nation. I don't know what nationality you feel. I'm assuming most people watching this are going to feel English. You all know that I am and feel proudly Welsh. I didn't choose Welshness. I was born there to Welsh parents. Being Welsh was out of my control. and I'm very proud of that, as you know. But whatever earthly nationality you consider yourself to be, the truth is that none of us begin life as part of this holy nation. The Bible makes it clear that naturally we're left, left to our own devices. We're all rebels and outsiders and enemies to this holy nation. We certainly aren't holy in the sense of being righteous and behaving perfectly. And so we're not a part of this nation. Because we don't live like members of this nation naturally. We don't obey its king. And to make it worse, we can't get into this nation ourselves either. There's no form filling, no tithing, no meeting attending, no baptism rites or rituals or being a nice person that can get us in. No, we've all sinned and we've therefore demonstrated we're not 
and cannot become part of this holy nation. There's no application form. But there is one way into this nation, but there's only one. To get one way to get into this kingdom of the Father. Jesus himself says in John 14 verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. No one gets into this nation except through Jesus, through accepting and admitting that he is king and we've rebelled against him and we need his forgiveness. Through accepting and admitting that we can't get in on our own and seeing our complete dependence on Jesus to have paid the entrance fee entirely. So we can be a part of this nation, not because of our own holiness, but because instead he gives us his holiness. We only get it by trusting in Jesus' promise that we can come to the Father, the King of kings and the Lord and lords, through his death, taking the punishment that we deserve for our rebellion in our place. And then by repenting, turning away from trying to live how we want to live with our own king as kings, as ourselves, and turning to God. And saying sorry for trying to live in our own kingdom without him as king. And then choosing and wanting and asking for his help to live with him as our king. That's the only way in. So right at the start. Are you part of this nation? Are you part of this nation? How do you know? What is it that makes you part of this nation? Is it something you do? Or is it something Jesus has done for you? And you you trusting in him and him alone for that? How does your life demonstrate you're part of this nation? Are you part of this group of people set apart to declare God's praises and receive this inheritance of all inheritances? I'm not asking if you're a regular church attender or a giver of money or if you read your Bible every day or even if you pray. I'm asking if you've ever turned to Jesus, said sorry for your sin and rebellion against this king. And if you've ever asked him for his perfect holiness to be given to you, even though you don't deserve it. And then have you trusted, not in your own feeling saved or your own good living, have you trusted that he loves to give it to us, this holiness? And then have you set your mind and your heart with God's help to live with him as king and king, sorry, as king and lord of your life in this new kingdom? If you haven't done that and you're watching this, why not? What's what's stopping you? Do you think you don't need it? There is nothing you need more. Then what's more important than this? See, nothing. This holy nation, this inheritance that 1 Peter talks about that we're going to receive is never going to get boring or dull or lose its value, no matter how much things on this earth will. There's going to be no pain or hurt or sadness or disappointment or frustration in the eternity with this holy nation. But anything else and everything else, no matter whether that's religion or not, that you cling to in this life is only going to fade and perish and let you down eventually so why not today come and trust in jesus and ask for his forgiveness he loves to forgive and then live with a new king and a new identity secured for eternity with a new king who will never let you down pause the video now don't watch any more if you haven't yet done that in your life Everything being a member of this nation means, all of the rest of the promises in this book of 1 Peter, every single command and promise can only be claimed if you're really a part of this nation. So make sure you are, because it's worth it. And we need to realise that no matter our backgrounds or our culture or our upbringing, every single one of us begins life outside of this nation. But God in his grace and mercy has made a way for us to join it. As a local church family at Avenue or whatever church is nearest to you or you're watching this, we're part of a worldwide church family and we are a holy nation. So why not come and join us? But then for us Christians, these people who know we're part of this holy nation, I think this picture encourages us, secondly, to be with this nation. Be with this nation. If you're a Christian, you have a new identity, a national identity that is longer lasting and above any other earthly identity, even Welshness. You're a citizen of heaven, of the heavenly kingdom. Yes, we're exiled for a little while here on earth. Peter describes us elsewhere in this letter as foreigners and exiles, just a few verses later. But we're foreigners and exiles because we're part of this new, different, holy nation. 
And if you're a Christian watching this, the reality of that doesn't just stop there. Our salvation doesn't just change our relationship with the king of this new nation. It doesn't just make us a part of uh, his people instead of his enemies. But we need to see that it also changes our relationship with every other member of this nation. And so Peter and the rest of the New Testament writers encourage us to deliberately and consciously choose to live with members of this nation, to be with the other members of this nation. You see, growing up, I was taught and probably tended to view, and you might have been the same, that my Christianity is, is a personal relationship with God. And it definitely is. I don't want to say that isn't the case, because it is. But if you only see it as that, that neglects the fact that this relationship has got implications for how you should live with other people as a result. This personal relationship with the king of this holy nation results in loads of secondary other relationships. The relationships that our new King Jesus creates between us and the rest of his body, his nation, the church. You see, that's what a Christian is. It's someone who has been reconciled to the King of Kings, the ruler of this holy nation. And as a result, it's someone who's also been reconciled to the rest of the other members of God's holy nation. And perhaps, frustratingly sometimes, these relationships are not ones that we can pick and choose depending on who we like or may not like from the many Christians in the world. No, God has saved us to grow in relationships with an actual flesh and blood group of people, our local church, the church we've committed to. That's avenue for most of us watching. This isn't, I'm not just saying this off my own back. Let's have a look at Ephesians 2 very quickly. You want to turn to your Bibles, I'm just going to reference that quickly now. In the first 10 verses of Ephesians 2, Paul describes what it means to be saved by God in Jesus with a brilliant picture of salvation. But he then goes on after that to describe what this means for the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in that local church, which is a sort of catch-all way of saying everyone else in that local church. And therefore, as a result of that, it bases between all of those who are part of this new people. He says, in some of the verses there, he says that Christ has reconciled all people groups together. He's removed any walls that divided people before and caused hostility. Speaking about the division between Jews and Gentiles, Paul says... Verse 15, God's purpose was to create in himself, sorry, Christ's purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two or the different people groups, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. See, in the first century world, there would have been the, to the people Paul was writing to Jews and everybody else. But God has removed any dividing walls between any people groups and reconciled all people groups together to create one new body. And what's the outworking of that? Look at verse 19. Consequently, as a result of that, you are no longer foreigners and strangers from each other, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and arises to become a, a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. There are so many pictures that Paul uses in just that, those few verses. Fellow citizens, members of his household, joined together, a dwelling for God to live in by his spirit. Take your pick. If you're a Christian, you are bonded and bound to your local church family in a special and strong way. Being part of this new holy nation means that our relationship with every other member of this nation is now changed. So the question from this picture is, do we live like that's the case? Are we living like this is true for us? How can and should we live like this more? J.I. Packer said the quote, the only proof of past conversion is present convertedness. And part of that convertedness is how we live among and with our brothers and sisters in our local church family. This is so necessary. And the writers of the New Testament know that it's so important that we do this more and more, I think for two reasons. Firstly, this living as a church family, as a united bound gospel family, is the biggest witness we have of the reality of the Christian faith to a world that is separated from God. Yes, part of our calling as Christians is to give energy over to calling more people to join this new nation. 
But if you read through the New Testament letters, what is the challenge that the writers of those letters give to Christians in local churches again and again? Is it, do more evangelism better? Or is it love one another better? That's loving one another, isn't it? It doesn't take much reading of the New Testament letters to see that. That was Jesus' command to his disciples right before he died, wasn't it? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples. So why is that the emphasis? Rather than how they evangelise or how they reach out. Why is the New Testament so bothered with how a group of local Christians in a local church interact and live with one another? Well, the reason is because a healthy, loving, united, passionate local church will be the best possible gospel witness to the world around us. A church that is living in community and loving each other through the power of the Spirit, forgiving each other with gospel hearts because they've been forgiven by God, rooted in the Word of God and living as fellow members of a holy nation, will always be the best evangelistic tool that we have as Christians. If we want to reach our city for Jesus, then we will need to be active, supportive, loving, sacrificial, committed members of Avenue Church. That's why that's the emphasis here in the Bible of being healthy, gospel-centred churches. It's so dominant in the New Testament. Being a healthy embassy of this holy nation is the best and most effective way to call more people to join us. But secondly, along with it being the best witness for the gospel... Living actively as members of this holy nation is a vital part of us keeping following Jesus. Being a committed part of a local church is vital to our spiritual perseverance. We need each other. I need you to help me keep going in this Christian life. And you need your church. The writer of Hebrews says it like this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, talking about the day that Jesus will return. But do you see from those verses, do you see how being together is needed to keep each other holding firmly to the hope of this future kingdom? It's so easy to forget the hope that we have in the world we live in. But being together uh, helps us to keep living the kind of lives people of this new nation should live. Lives of love and good deeds, Hebrews says. One author I read this week says it like this. A solitary Christian who thinks he can live independently of the church functions about as well as a thumb severed from its hand. So how are we doing this? How are we loving one another? How can we encourage each other to do this more? How are we functioning as fellow members of this holy nation here at Avenue? How committed are we to each other and all of each other, not just the ones we naturally get on with better? How are we looking out for people who may have isolated themselves over the past seven months? Those people we've not seen on Zoom or in person. How are we encouraging others to come and be a part of us? If we want to see more people come and join this nation, if we want to see your friends and fellow nation members living wholeheartedly for Jesus... The Bible makes it so clear that prioritising this little outcrop of this worldwide holy nation is the best thing we can do. And if we want to keep growing in our walk with God and in our spiritual life, and if we want our family and our children to prioritise walking with God in our spiritual life, then we need to prioritise this nation above everything else. And yes, these times we're living in make it harder to do that currently on a Sunday. Our current physical meetings are going to look different probably for quite a while to what we're used to but the call is still the same how are we being members of this holy nation how are we helping others if possible are we desperate to get to the physical meetings that we have i know not everyone's going to feel safe and able to and some people will need to shield but those of us who do come also might not really enjoy them the way we used to enjoy sundays and there may well be other more fun things we could go and do instead. But the Bible calls us, the gospel calls us still to come physically if possible. We're not to give up meeting together for any reason. Because we need each other. We need each other because being a member of this holy nation is vital to our own gospel witness. And it's vital to our own gospel growth. This picture encourages us to live with 
the other members of this holy nation among each other, committed to each other, encouraging each other, forgiving each other, mourning with each other and loving each other. Can I encourage you, can I encourage all of us to do this more in the weeks ahead? But there's another angle, there's another encouragement that this picture of a holy nation gives us. And second, I want to encourage us through this picture of a holy nation to, to be like this holy nation. What, what I mean by that essentially is we need to be striving to live holy lives, as Peter commanded us back in chapter 1 verse 16. And being with members of this holy nation helps us to keep fighting sin helps us to live holy lives day in, day out. Being active parts of this holy nation helps other uh, other members among us to live like members of this holy nation should live. Being a part of this holy nation is vital to our personal holiness because sin breeds in isolation, but holiness grows in community. Sin breeds in isolation, but holiness grows in community. If you or I want to sin, if we want to deliberately disobey and run away from God, we're going to find it a lot harder to do if we're living lives among each other. Instead, we'll do it alone, especially those sins we know that are wrong. We might have a smaller group of people around us who enjoy the same sinful things as us, but we're going to do that away from the main body of a local church family because sin breeds an isolation. So if you want to grow in sin, just spend less time with your church family. And with your church community that might be physically you can remove yourself physically by never turning up to things and never joining in with anything but we can isolate ourselves by our attitudes and the way that we think or act about our fellow church members when we're around them or we can isolate ourselves by never really engaging honestly with other members of our church i'm fine or we can do that by starting a little clique inside of a church family of people we like particularly and people from outside of that we don't really engage with do that and we'll find that sinful attitudes and sinful behaviours and sinful desires can easily get a foothold and quickly. And so if you want to rebel and run away from God and disobey his calling of holiness on our lives, and if we want to give in to the temptations we face, just isolate yourselves. Distance yourself from others. Pretend everything's fine. Wear hypothetical masks beneath our COVID face masks. Keep people at arm's length. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. And then sin will grow easily to the point where we won't even be sure if we've got any control over it anymore. If you've ever found yourself trapped in cycles of sin, you'll know how true this is. Sin breeds in isolation, whether that's physical or emotional. One of the cleverest lies the devil tells Christians is that they don't need the local church in order to keep living for Jesus. That church life is an optional extra for a Christian. That being an active part of our churches is more of a hassle than a benefit. But the Bible makes it clear that sin breeds in isolation. But holiness grows in community. Holiness, our individual holiness, being more like God, grows in community as we show and are shown grace and mercy and love. And where sin is called out and where we're called to repent by other fellow members of this nation. When we share our hearts and our thoughts and our worries and our concerns and our temptations and our desires and our emotions and our sorrows and our heartbreaks. And where other members of this nation pour love and compassion and care and sympathy and rebuke and support onto one another. There we'll find holiness growing. There we will find individuals all fighting sin with each other and helping each other to live more like Jesus day to day and be better witnesses in a world that desperately needs to see our saviour. But this holiness isn't just fighting sinful acts. No, this holiness means that we'll grow in godliness too. We'll grow together in those areas of life that we need and want to be more like Christ. If you look back at 1 Peter 2 verse 1, there's a list of things we're called to rid ourselves of. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. If we live well in church community, we'll find those begin to be replaced by love, honesty, truthfulness, celebrating each other's achievements and speaking about and to one another in love. 
Instead of anger, we'll grow together in patience as we pray for one another, rebuke one another, forgive one another when we fail and rejoice with each other when we grow spiritually and when we have victory over sin and when we display Christ-likeness. And all of this will happen most effectively when we're living as part of a local holy nation. Because this local expression of this worldwide holy nation, it will encourage us to refocus our minds day to day, week in, week out, month after month, to give everything we have to live for God because it is worth it. To choose to fight sin instead of giving in to our desires when they occur because it is worth it. This picture of a holy nation encourages us to be regularly a physical part of our local picture of this nation. And for us, that's Avenue Church. However we can, and then to live lives together that look like we're part of this holy nation. Fighting sin, running after holiness, comforting people who hurt with the truth of the gospel. If you want the world around to see Jesus and come to know him. If you want our children and our young people to see Jesus and come to know him. If you want to grow in Christ-likeness, then we will commit to our local church. So how are we doing that at the moment? How is your life, how has our life as part of this holy nation taken a knock over this last year? It's been strange and difficult for all of us, hasn't it? But what does being a part of this holy nation look like for you? Are there any areas we need to repent of in terms of how we view the importance of being active and committed parts of our church? Are there sins or struggles that we're trying to fight without the help and support of other members of this holy nation? Are there sins or struggles we don't want to fight? So we're removing ourselves from this holy nation. Are we deliberately avoiding and hiding from each other so we don't have to confess sins and we don't have to admit weakness and we don't have to admit hurts? Are we believing the lie that we don't need each other and that we can do just fine without church and just making church an optional extra to our Christian lives? The truth is, if you're a Christian, you are part of this holy nation, a nation that will one day receive the inheritance that Christ won for us, an eternal inheritance that will never spoil, perish or fade and that we can never lose and where we will have perfect intimacy with the Father and perfect intimacy with each other. So any embarrassment or cost we need to pay to be a member of this holy nation is completely worth it. Anything we have to give up on this earth to be with God's people, no matter how good it might be, is worth giving up because anything you're asked to give up and sacrifice and suffer is only temporary anyway and the inheritance we're destined for is not so this picture of the church us as a group of people being a holy nation it gives us an encouragement that we have been chosen by god and appointed as priests and set apart by him declared holy as a new spiritual nation for a purpose to declare the praises of god in a world that rejects him it encourages us to live as members of this holy nation in our local church. It is the best gospel witness we have to the world around us. And it's the best equipping we have to help us fight sin in our lives and to grow in our holiness. And so as part of this holy nation, we are to fight sin together. We need to be together regularly, often and sacrificially because it's worth it. But all of this is true only for people who are part of this holy nation. You can't have dual nationality. There's no halfway point. You can't play for both this nation and another nation. No, you're either in it or you're not. Where are you right now? If you're a Christian, you're part of a holy nation. So let's live like that. Mm -hmm.